Thank you. I haven't done anything yet, so thank you very much. We are starting tonight with the Fuso Talks and the topic Embracing the Future. Fuso Talks is all about giving you some inspiration, inviting speakers who speak about things which have nothing to do with the truck business, um, but with things that are interesting, that inspire you, and that are moving the world around us. And before we come to the Fuso Talks, of course, um, the event wouldn't start really if we wouldn't have our CEO and president for MFDBC and the head of Daimler Trucks Asia addressing all of you with some welcome words. I would ask you to join me here on stage, Mr. Listoseya. Please. Warm welcome. First of all, welcome all of you coming here because some of you came around from across the world. Today we have three really cool guests and they will speak about the future and the innovations which some of them will be related to us and some of them will not be related to us. But I tell you, they will be all related to us when we speak about us as private people. Because what we see in the next three, four years is an acceleration of the digitalization which we are facing. All of us are exactly on the edge of a totally different time. In five years, we will be surrounded by things we cannot even imagine. Why is it so? Because we have an acceleration in so many fields of technology. Medical systems will be totally different than we know it today. Entertainment will be different. We know it already. The importance of TV is going down dramatically. On-demand services will cluster and will tailor our life. We have end-to-end -end customer data. We will have sensors around us. We have so many things which will influence us that it is an absolutely sometimes not imaginable what will happen. If you just remind yourself what was 10 years ago, you needed a command system and you paid 3,600 euros for it. Who's using maps today? Nobody. Of course, all the people like it, like me, but the youngsters, maps, excuse me, what is it? In the whole 19th century, the pictures which were done in this century, in the whole 19th century, the, the first picture was done, I think, in Paris, roughly 1840, okay? And then they started to do a lot of pictures. It, it took a long time to take pictures. Some of you remember how difficult it was. You had to take the pictures, you took the film out, and then you went to a shop and then develop it, and it took at least one week to get the pictures. And you had no chance to change it or to do it again. It was really something. So the whole pictures which were taken in the 19th century are taken today in 30 seconds in the world. How many people are employed to develop pictures? How many people are working for Instagram? How many people are working for WhatsApp? I can tell you, not a tenth, which worked only for one company 25 years ago, Kodak. They had 145,000 people working for them. And where are these people now? Where are they? They had to develop some strategies because the Kodak is all gone. If you ask experts from an industry, they all will fail. Why? because their perspective is narrowed. They are so familiar with all the industry. Truck, truck, truck for 20 years, that's me. So I know everything, I think so. The thing is you know nothing because you cannot imagine disruption. We think it goes like that and then it goes like that and then it goes like that, like this. But we're not prepared when something goes like this or like this. And that makes it very, very dangerous for all of us. Today, we will see and we will hear from three gentlemen from different angles of innovation, with different backgrounds, what can happen and how fast and how quick it can happen. And this is why I can only encourage you, listen openly, think for yourself, don't listen to the yes butters. Think and have a dream. 
because everything of humankind starts with a dream. Otherwise, ladies and gentlemen, we would still sit in the cave and the cage, by the way, and we would say, oh, outside there's a tiger. It's better to sit inside. So nobody would have explored anything if you don't take risk, if you open your mind and you believe in the impossible and the impossible, because that makes us the leaders. And leaders have to manage uncertainty. And that's what you are. You manage uncertainty and you lead people before you say, I manage people and I lead uncertainty. No, 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 no. You manage the uncertainty and you lead the people. And that's what you are here for. I wish you a lovely evening and thank you for your patience. And now the real show starts. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Listeseer. Today's topic, and we heard it already, is embracing the future. And um, we have three experts on that topic. Of course, we can't predict the future. We can see where it's going to, but we can never predict it. And I guess even those gentlemen can, can't predict it, but at least they professionally deal with what's coming up and what are the trends in society. Um, the first speaker that I would like to welcome is Greg Williams, the editor of The Wired magazine from the UK. And he will speak on how to develop a change mind mindset in a networked uh, worked world. Welcome on stage, Greg Williams. <laughs> Greg, thank you, Florian. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you sir. The second speaker is uh, Morinusuke Kawaguchi, Japanese, obviously, and a futurist and advisor to the Japanese government and many other companies also, um, who today will talk to us about brain-machine interfaces. Well, that's something. That's really future talk. Welcome on stage, Kawaguchi-san. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Please. The third speaker, and today we have, again, a third speaker because the topic is so interesting. Usually it's only two. Um, is Peter David Peterson, a uh, Danish national born in Denmark, but more than 20 years in Japan. Um, I was actually astonished that most of the material he had for presentation was only in Japanese, so he basically created that presentation for us today in English, extra for us. Um, he is advising com companies on sustainability and also tra trains them on how to become future-proof organizations, and his topic tonight is the resilient corporation. Please welcome on stage, with the shortest way to us, because he actually lives in Kauizawa, Peter David Pisen. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So let's get started right away. Having all these exciting gentlemen here with me. Um, maybe, Greg, let's, let's start with you. You are the editor of The Wired magazine. Mm -hmm. So when did you decide to focus your career rather on technology trends than on centerfold women or whatever other options you might have? There were clearly no other <laughs> options in that field. Um, I, I mean, I've always been interested in the future, always been interested in technology, ideas, business. Um, and I think that it was kind of like a very natural fit. Um, because I think that what was interesting is that I, I started at Wired in, when was it, 2008, 2009, around then. And around that time, Wired was kind of very much kind of like, almost like an outlier within the, the culture. We were seen as sort of slightly geeky, slightly nerdy. And now if you look at kind of some of the biggest stories that are going on in, within the culture, they're all relating to technology and ideas. Just the last sort of, you know, sort of month, all these kind of interesting ideas about maybe how uh, the US election was affected by kind of fake news on social networks, uh, some of the kind of the, uh, the, the, the bills that have been passing through the House of uh, Commons, House of Lords in the, in the UK about internet privacy affecting the rights of individuals. We're seeing the world moving in a way, the world, why was kind of like, you know, an early kind of uh, sort of sense, uh, had an early sense of what was happening, and the world's moved towards it. So it's a great time. You know, we, we, we don't just write about robots and about artificial intelligence. We write about, you know, politics and the world, way the world is changing. So it's, a, it's an exciting time, you know? Mm -hmm. Then there's almost nothing that we can't touch on. I guess so. Yeah. Um, 
Wired Magazine is, of course, a, a publication. It's in the publishing, publishing business. And yeah. that business is one of the businesses that's shaken the most yeah. from digitalization. Um, digitalization doesn't only um, change the channels, but also the form that um, companies are organized. Um, are there... Um, how, how have you reacted as a publishing house um, yeah. to, to that trend? Do you have your team teams differently organized than, than uh, um, a magazine would have been organized 10 years ago or 20? That's a great question. That's exactly right. Things have changed so much. I mean, first of all, to your point in terms of like the business operation, that's really changed significantly. The way that magazines used to operate was that they were they, the commercial operation was entirely dependent on advertising for a print product. And obviously, as the world's changed and digital has kind of come into place, now much of that advertising has moved online. But there are also other kind of ways that you can kind of maximize, uh, you know, your commercial opportunities by we, we run a lot of events now. We have a consultancy business. Um, so we see, see ourselves touching on, you know, a lot of um, media companies. Now we talk about touch points. We don't talk about readers. We talk about all the different ways that people might interact with the brand whether that's on social media, or whether that's at an event, or whether that's in a consultancy, or picking up the print product. But, but the other thing, to your point, I think is really interesting, is that the teams have now become integrated in a much more kind of um, a clearer way, sorry, a, a much less sort of rigid way. So people have to be able to sort of uh, curate a conference. And this is, I'm talking about editors now. They have to be able to write for the digital product and the, uh, the, the online. Uh, they also have to think about what's going on in print. So people have to be more flexible. They have to be able to sort of uh, understand that their roles are no longer just this one track. And they have to be willing and open and curious to, to other ways of, of communicating. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, I, th I think that we were one of the first industries to really start getting disrupted. And um, you know that had a pretty tough effect on a large parts of the industry. But, Fortunately, you know, we, we, we've, we've thrived. So, uh, you know, there's no wood here. I'll just have to touch my head to say, I, I hope that continues. <laughs> um, interesting topic, and I, I'm sure you have much more for it. So I think it's the best time to um, give you the stage and have Thank your you, speech. Florian. Thank, Thank you, Thank you. Thanks. Greg. Cheers. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Greg Williams from Wired. And uh, as the intro said, I have a pretty fun job. So I get to spend my days uh, talking to the people who are really kind of thinking about what's coming next. So the entrepreneurs, the investors, the, um, uh, the scientists, the business people who are really trying to sort of get to grips with the trends that are going to be affecting the world in the coming years. So we're in the mobile internet era now. The only thing we know for absolute sure is that over the next few years, we're going to see relentless change driven by data-centric technologies that are going to allow us to do business and understand the world in entirely new ways. The relationship between bits and atoms is getting very, very complicated, but it's only going to speed up. It's accelerating. As the president just said, things are never going to move this slowly again. This is a, a you know, talking about data. Um, this is a kind of like, I'm sure you've heard stats like this. 90% of the world's data was created in the last two years. This offers us some context of where we're going. Uh, by 2020, it's going to have uh, quadrupled. So I'm sure that some of you in this room might be familiar with Moore's Law, which is a basic law of computing, which is that processing power doubles or halves in price every 18 months. And what that means is that growth in technology is no longer linear. It's no longer incremental. It's exponential. It's that graph. It's that steep now. And that is bringing about a fundamental change in the nature of information and the way that we do business. So we now, now have internet-connected meters uh, for smart metering. We now have automation in healthcare, automation in all kinds of other industries, including telecommunications, robotics in manufacturing, black box trading in the finance industry. We have machine learning, natural language processing, artificial intelligence, machine-to-machine -machine systems that communicate over the internet without the mediation of human beings. Fundamentally, today, we are now living inside a network. So our homes, our jobs, our cars, increasingly our bodies are connected to the internet in real time on a highly, highly individualized basis. So the key points that I'd like to kind of emphasize in the next sort of 10, 15 minutes, digital means that every organization, every business today is a technology company. It's completely shifted the customer mindset. 
expectation has gone up and it's only going in one direction. There is no kind of sense of like business as usual. That's gone. The president talked about Kodak, and that's a great example. It dominated its, its field until, uh, until relatively recently when, um, uh, when it was disrupted by Instagram. Instagram employed just 18 people. So there's no such thing as business as usual any longer. An incumbent can be challenged by a small, agile competitor. Digital now means that innovation is a necessity. We have to adapt to the new, and it means we have to be open. We have to collaborate. We have to work with people within our organizations, but also on the outside as well, and that's tough for some people. Today, if your competition, your competition is best in class, it doesn't matter what industry you're working in. So if you, you're a, a retailer, maybe you think that your competition is, I don't know, The Gap or Uniqlo or Amazon, something like that. What you actually have to do is think about all the brands that your consumer today is interacting with. So they're working, you know, they're, they're interacting with Starbucks, they're interacting with Emirates, the, they're interacting with Tokyo Bank or their local library or the coffee store that knows their order when they work, walk through the door. So you're being judged against every brand or service in the marketplace, whether they are a direct competitor or not. So we need to be able to kind of join all these dots up. We need to be able to make lots of connections in a very complex world. One of the ways we can do that, we can leverage our data. So we spend a lot of time, as I was saying earlier on, thinking about the, the data within our businesses. And that's right, you know, we can t tell a lot of things about how our business uh, is performing. But what a lot of businesses are now thinking about is the data outside their organizations. How can they tell what's coming next? How can they find opportunity? from looking at that and examining that. This is happening in, in, in the car, in the world of uh, automotive as well. Natural language processing startups. Uh, I, I spoke to one in California a few months ago. He can predict monthly sales of cars in the United in States with about 90% accuracy simply by looking at what people are saying on social media. It's an incredibly reliable way of figuring out the way people are thinking. So we need to be thinking about opportunity outside our walls, and, uh, and to improve collaboration with others inside our organization as well. Ben Horowitz, the Silicon Valley entrepreneur and investor, he likens where we are with the internet to the very, very early days of the internal combustion engine. And the internal combustion engine didn't just lead to the rise of the train and then the automobile. It led to sort of like world-changing shifts. So the move from the, uh, the, the countryside to the city, the move from an agrarian economy to an industrial economy, the rise of the city, the rise of the suburb, the, the rise of the big box retailer, all these huge shifts. And I think we need to be thinking in these terms, right? These big world changing shifts that we're going through. That's not happening in the future, it's happening now. It's happening at this very moment and we need to seize hold of it. The purpose of every single piece of technology ever invented isn't the technology itself. The technology is invented for one simple reason, and that is human need. So fundamentally, I think we're going to continue doing what we've been doing for millennia. We're going to be educating, entertaining, exciting, selling to people through making really sort of deep, important human connections. That is not going to change, because fundamentally, it's not about the technology, it's about all of us. Thanks very much. Kawaguchi-san, to start with yourself, one of the best known and most influential futurists in Japan, let me ask you a very naive question at the beginning. <laughs> what does a futurist do and how do you become one? The technology itself is more like a science, the achievement of a science, like a 3D printer or the IPS cell kind of thing. But the, this innovation is more like the, the function, what we can achieve out of the technology. Mm -hmm. And then people are really confused about it. People are talking about the technology and the innovation. But, you know, actually what we can do the mostly is the function innovation. Technology is more like a scientist's work in the laboratory of the, in the, in the, in the school, the university. Mm -hmm. So I, the, there is a technology almost like a science, and then there is a function. Or, and a function can be converted into the market the specification, what they want. So the market, the function, and the technology, I had to translate you know, twice to make it the variable, you know, the value of the technology. That's just the potential. How to make it into our society's value. 
So value is the issue of the everything, I thought. So then I thought, what's the future value? And the, the value is everything, what we can provide. So I thought, I gotta quit this company, and I gotta think like, a, you know, the SCARA, and I quit my company. The, the, it was famous uh, global consulting firm, but uh, then spending like a whole two years in my, in my room, reading all the future book in the world. Then I wrote this, uh, you know, mega trend book from the Nikkei. And I, you know, I thought, you know, I, in my mind, it was quite uh, well organized. What's the definition of this technology, you know, and the innovation and whatever. So I was almost very much interested in this culture too, because that sense of value is really closely relating to what we want for our society, in the British society or the Japanese society. So it's different what they want. And a clever person can clarify it and make it into the specification of that product or service. Mm -hmm. And if he knows the technology, he can connect to the technology. So that kind of relation, you know, sequence of this value was, I was, you know, the organizing in the whole process of this, mm -hmm. you know, what kind of technology, what kind of future. So you're basically a translator between uh, <laughs> yeah, our the technology market. and the trends and, and, yeah. and the people who still don't understand them. I think it's time to give you the stage for your presentation. Okay, today's topic is a uh, man-machine interface. So when you hear the word man-machine interface, what comes to your mind is for some of you guys, probably this kind of high-tech gadget like a smart glasses or smart watches kind of thing, right? But let me begin the story with the ancestors of those very common products around us. These are the original product, original first production model of these three items from the achievement of the technology from the previous centuries. And here is the brief summary of this history of the pair of glasses and a typewriter, and a wristwatch. Overall, looking at this kind of design, you know, it's almost completed from the beginning. It's not so much different from the modern glasses or the watches or anything, right? This Remington number one was the first typewriter. We still use the keyboard, same. The designer of this Remington number one thought the, uh, we human being would use this complicated structure by two fingers. But 15 years later, after the release of this production model to the market, this touch key was discovered. Wow, we can use you know, 10 fingers at the same time and, uh, without looking at it. That was a sensation. We can do this? And then, look at this. It's so, so excited, people. Are. This is this... Uh, Secretary's competition in America. So they are so proud how much they can do it. So imagine if you are the designer, first designer of this Remington number one, you could never even imagine we, we, we can do this. Now it's no, nobody wonder, but you know, that, that was the huge impact. So what we can learn from this is our redundancy or the flexibility of manipulating the machine is beyond the imagination of the poor engineer's mind. This evolution of typewriting system, for example, has improved and it will improve more and more, like motion capturing, voice recognition, and gesture capturing, and then finally, final goal is probably this direct brain cognitive system. Direct brain without using the voice or anything. There are two basic approach. One is non-invasive, such as using the infrared sensors on the cap, you wear the cap, and then detect the activity, activity, activity of the brain. Sometimes even invasive technology for the very handicapped person, like she has the chip mounted inside of the brain, and then this, this machine can suck the vital signal and then convert it, and then transmit it into this digital system so that she can manipulate this man-made hand. 
it's really unbelievable. This kind of technology is really getting advanced nowadays. So basically, basically this brain machine interface has a two big exits. One is that new, new neural marketing kind of neural blah 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 business. Using this feedback of the vital code, you can improve the marketing or the designing the stuff, what training process or anything. And the other exit is the brain blah 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 business. You can directly manipulate the machine or even communicate, brain to brain communicate without using the voice expression or typing expression. It's like a telepathy, it's coming. At the same time, physically machine is getting close, as I mentioned, to be the wearable. That's the fate of the technology. It used to be both mobility gear or the information gear, that's butter. It used to be the furniture like stationary, becomes the handy, mobile, then wearable. So I was talking about four topics today. First topic, remember, this mental barrier is so big, and usually engineers underestimate this psychological part, liberal art. Second topic, I was talking about the human performance. You know, designer's imagination, no matter how much he or she thinks, this perform. Our, we can perform a lot beyond the imagination. So do not underestimate the human redundancy. The third topic was brain as the ultimate interface. There are two exits. One is a neurofeedback system for to improve the marketing or the training or anything. And the one other exit is manipulating directly. The machine sometimes, sometimes the communication directly, telepathy, right? And then Lastly, I was talking about the relationship between this technology and the function. And then it tend to be always go flooding into this operational world. But okay, let's stop a little moment. What's the opposite word of this operation? There are many opposite words. And I was just talking about the Japanese opposite word. It's usually mild and weak and whatever. In one word, it's herbivore direction. That's a Japanese you know, mentality. So going through this man and machine interface, there are lots of insights you might get it, right? And I hope uh, this can lead you some kind of innovation on your work. Thank you very much. And I would like to, to turn to uh, Peter, David Peterson, Peter. Um, you are advising companies on sustainable de development and lately also on how to become resilient. But you studied cultural anthropology in Copenhagen. That doesn't mm. sound like the natural preparation for consulting companies on future topics. How did you come to live in Japan, to live here in Kawasawa, and then um, consulting the companies <laughs> in the, these areas? Well. That, that Sounds like an interesting journey. Uh, I was suddenly invited. I suddenly had a call back in 1994 from a friend in Japan. I was just finishing university, and the friend said, we have a small consulting company in Tokyo. Come and be a manager. I said, oh, I'm, I'm doing cultural anthropology. He said, no, it doesn't matter. We want you. So it's a very human thing. Uh, so I was suddenly thrown into working with uh, small and medium-sized companies on consulting, organizational issues, and so on. So it's been on-the-job training since 1995, basically. Mm -hmm. The reason I live here is uh, 311. We have 911 in the US and Japan. We had another kind of d disaster, you know, 311 in, in 2011, the earthquake. So I thought it was time to move out of Tokyo and get into this uh, lovely place. We're 950 meters over the sea, you know. Great place to be, uh, good air, good Pretty water, safe. and so on. So nicer place to live, I just decided. I get that. Hmm. Um, I was talking earlier about one of the first Fuso talks where we had Dr. Thomas Karberger, who's the head of the Japan Renewable Energy Foundation and who talked about how he struggles to establish renewable energy here. And he explained it's really difficult to convince government officials and, and companies and large um, that this change is a necessary change um, and, and describe the environment as very change averse. So yes. how, how do you feel are, are Japanese companies open to the way of consulting that you do and to, well, actually, to basically uh, change, doing no, that change to become an, a learning organization? That's a very cultural issue actually. That, that's where it comes back to cultural anthropology because Japanese culture is very conservative. That also means they're very stable, you know, uh, continue to provide high quality over a number of years, 
sort of very high teamwork, but the opposite side of that medal is uh, lack of openness sometimes, a lack of risk taking, an organizational culture where sticking out is not appreciated. So it's two sides of the same coin. And Japan is very strong on the quality, the sort of discipline side, and still very weak on taking risks and really jumping into new innovations. So that's what I'm trying to encourage mm -hmm. with my approach. So please, Thank the you. stage is yours. Peter Thank David, you. please. please. I'm going to talk about the resilient corporation and how to sort of future-proof your organization, which is, of course, impossible to do in its entirety, but you can do better than others, and that's what we want to try to do. I would like to say we've been talking about the future, and I think the starting point is going back to what the CEO, whose name I could not remember in one session, I'm afraid, <laughs> uh, he said, we must dream. Unless we dream about what future we want to create and are not just carried away by technological trends, we will never have a desirable future. So I really think we should start there. But apart from that, how can we future-proof our organization, try to create a resilient organization that, is, that rides on the change, that enjoys the change, that really not only manages the uncertainty, but actually extracts new opportunities out of uncertainty. That is what I call the resilient organization. I'm basically going to be talking about glasses, like Mr. Kawaguchi. Uh, but the glasses that I'm going to be talking about are glasses with three lenses. I'll show you an example in a few moments. I say, as you can see on this slide, that just by looking at what is above the surface, top of the iceberg, which is sales, profits, products, services, you cannot tell whether the company is resilient. Think of Enron, 2002. They looked like they were a high-flying company. Four days because before they sort of exploded in midair, they had a triple-A financial rating from Moody's and Standard & Poor's and so on. Then bang, they exploded. The reason was below the surface. So let's look below the surface. What are the triple-A's of organizational performance? I'm sure you could choose many others. I, through my work, have identified three. The first is anchoring. Second is adaptiveness. And the third is alignment with the age in which we live, with society, and with key stakeholders. Danone in the 1990s wanted to be Nestle. They wanted to be a general food company that could do everything. The result, they ended up with 300 different products, 12 different product lines, completely unclear brand image, very low morale inside the company. They were becoming completely unanchored. Then they had a shift of management in 1996, and the new CEO decided that they needed to re-anchor, or they called it in Danone, re-centering. They needed to reset their mission. They needed to focus their business divisions around the mission. And they would do only business that related to that new mission. And what he actually did in 10 years, he sold off about 60% of the assets of the company. Business divisions that did not fit with the mission were sold off. Sauce business was sold to Ajinomoto in Japan. Glass business was sold to another company. They focused on markets where they could win and where they had alignment with their mission. It took about 10 years, and for many years, sales stayed flat. But then after 2007, they really started, sales figures started improving. And I know one vice president in Danone who was involved in this process, and she says now she could not imagine doing business that is not related to the mission. And the mission, the new mission is bring health through food to as many people as possible on earth. All discussions in the company center around this new mission. Everyone is excited. We're not just trying to sell products. We're not just trying to make a profit. We are trying to take this mission to the world. And actually, that mission reaches back to the founding roots, 1919 in Barcelona, when Danone was created to produce yogurt for people, for children after the First World War, who were undernourished. Uh, so they sort of retranslated that old vision of yogurt for children into a new version, bring health through food to as many people as possible. And they very successfully re-anchored, and that made them a much stronger company. So of course, if you're a resilient organization, you will be better able to make profits in the future. But that's not all. What I've learned studying lots of corporations around the world, writing a book about this theme is that it's, such companies are also much nicer to work for. If you have a high degree of adaptiveness, if you're highly anchored, if you feel you're aligned with society, much, much nicer company to work for. So much higher 
employee motivation. Well, that leads to innovation. Innovation leads to new products, uh, on the edge business initiatives. And of course, a resilient corporation that really lives those three A's is much more welcomed by society and by key stakeholders. So I think there are very great benefits from looking at your organization through these glasses with three lenses. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Very insightful and I think also applicable to um, a lot of situations we're in. At this point in time, I would like to open the room now for all of your questions. Mr. Listosea, please join us. The room is open for questions. The question goes to you, Mr. Kawaguchi. What do you think, from all your knowledge looking into your crystal ball, what is the last human skill that keeps us <laughs> ahead from the machine? What is the last thing that will be coded in an algorithm? So this curiosity in one word is the torrent somehow which robot would never have it. And then innovation and the curiosity is apparently very fit word together, right? But when I talk to this, let's say the personnel department head in big companies in Japan, what they have to choose this uh, young stars out of the candidates to hire, what their headache the most is, is this person has a curiosity or not? That is quite difficult and at the same time, very difficult to train. It's not, it's opposite words of the skill. Like skill, typical skill is an Excel operation kind of thing, right? Or speak English or something. The point is curiosity is left over. <laughs> That's us, <laughs> right? And it actually, it means childless. You know, when you grow up, you are supposed to graduate from this fantasy world or anything. You are adult, so get rid of that kind of, you know, silly thing. But the, just re remember, when you are a child, everything was wondrous and everything was curious. Chuck Mas, my name. Mr. Peterson, just a question to you. Three AAs, what you said here, anchoring uh, adaptiveness and alignment. In, in our environment here in Japan, what are the, uh, uh, the uh, in your mind, the ranking of this three A's? I what is your experience? Uh, where, where we are lacking very much in this community in Japan, out of your experience, where we have to dig first in yeah. to uh, come forward? Because um, if I look for it myself, I don't know a way to start with these okay. no, three points. I would like to have a little bit of your yeah. experience on this. I think it's a very good question. I was lucky enough that uh, PwC got very interested in the AAA idea and they uh, offered to do a joint survey. So we just did a survey of 40 Japanese corporations, large corporations like Fusol, and uh, we had them self-diagnose, basically, through those nine, the nine questions were divided into a sort of a self-diagnosis. And it's very, very clear. It's adaptiveness and its center of adaptiveness is uh, unleashing innovation across an organization. Do you have not just sort of haphazard innovation, do you have a structure? that really allows people to bring out their innovative ideas. That is the weakest point uh, of Japanese corporations. And basically, the whole adaptiveness area is the weak point. Whereas alignment in large, old Japanese corporations is, very, is pretty strong, uh, pretty strong. Uh, and some, there's sort of, some are doing God, good on, uh, on uh, anchoring. Well, no, no, the anchoring part is very strong. Some are doing pretty good on alignment, others are not. But the area that is clearly weak is adaptiveness. Let's see. And it's a, it's a cultural issue as well. So really have to do a lot of work there. <clears throat> and adaptiveness is not just lo linked to business performance. It's linked to self-actualization. It's a top level of the Maslow pyramid. People will be happier if they, their ideas are heard, if they are able to be created. And if I was to uh, make a summary of everything, I think we've heard about the chances. We've, we've understood and knew before uh, that we are in an age of disruption and uh, dramatic changes, it holds many opportunities for us. There are risks, and it's certainly on us, on how we position us as an organization and that, how we anchor us in society, and how we take advantage of the um, uh, developments and shape them ourselves. I think we have plenty of things to discuss on your tables. I wish you a very pleasant evening and hope you enjoyed this. Thank you very much and good evening. <laughs>